Okay, good morning, um, everybody, those who are here and those who join later, that's fine. Um, we're we going to try and complete our discussion today about human reproduction. Uh, remember, please, that there is a substantial portion that you are to do on your own, which is all of that the, about the anatomy of um, reproductive, human reproductive systems, <clears throat> which I'm leaving to you to join you on because I'm sure that you've covered it before, biology in school or health sciences or whatever. Um, there's nothing particularly difficult about it. And because I want to reserve time to carefully discuss these hormonal systems, um, which are really complicated and um, which do require some considerable attention in order to understand them. Before we go any further, I just want to revise what we finished off with. We would have been talking about sperm production in males and oocyte production, egg production in um, the female. And um, remember that these are meiotic processes. Each of them produces from one cell uh, that undergoes meiosis, and each of them is going to produce four progeny. In males, all four of the, the progeny, this is my, I'm sorry, I hope that you can hear me. Uh, here, one second. Um, I think that I, I hope that this is okay and that you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay, uh, it's just that something strange is going on with my with my microphone. So um, I can hear I, you perfectly clear. Okay, fine. I hope that if that if the, if my headset gives up the ghost, at least the computer will pick it up. Okay. Yeah, no, I can uh, hear you. It makes no difference. Uh, all right, all right then. Oh, so in case in the in males sperm production is continuous if once puberty is passed and every meiotic division leads to the production of four sperm um, but in females there is a very strange situation in human beings um, and that is that in the embryo a part of meiosis is undergone for all of the oocytes so all of the oocytes that an embryo possesses start to undergo meiosis but they arrest they stop and they they stop at, actually at uh, bef before the first meiotic division has been completed and they just sit there um, they, they they then let me go back to here uh, because this explains this explains it a little bit better um, so in the embryo here, the, they form a primary oocyte, which is a cell which has started to undergo meiosis, but it stops. And it stops at prophase one. And uh, it sits there in, all of them sit there in the ovary like that until one of those ova, one of, the, one of them gets stimulated to go into development for the 28 days that the ovulation that is regulated in human beings to a 28 day cycle. So one of them is going to end up in a growing follicle. And that oocyte um, and completes meiosis one inside the maturing follicle. So they stop here and then they carry on once they are begin to be stimulated in this growing follicle. And then very strangely, for, first of all, they complete meiosis one. Meiosis one, you remember, you get two cells. And one of those cells is this little tiny polar body. It's a non-functional cell, but it contains half of the genetic material. And the other, this here is called the secondary oocyte. And the secondary oocyte carries on inside the, as the follicle matures until the follicle ruptures. And the secondary oocyte is then liberated. And it will only complete meiosis once fertilization takes place. It undergoes all of its divisions inside the, the cell, the nucleus divides and everything. But it only completes meiosis once it is 
fertilized. And within minutes of fertilization, it spits out another polar body. And that little polar body, again, it's non-functional. The net result is that we end up with one large egg and then three small polar bodies have been spat out. Remember that there's one produced, another one produced here, okay? And the, um, this fertilized egg is haploid, obviously, fertilized by the sperm, it becomes diploid. But within minutes of fertilization, it uh, completes its meiotic divisions. It's a very strange system. It goes partway through meiosis in the embryo, then they all just sit there and wait. And then only one of them proceeds through, usually only one of them every 28 days in human beings proceeds through the rest of meiosis and completes the meiotic divisions. Okay, so all of that, that 28 day cycle of producing an ovum every 28 days is under the hormone under hormonal control and under very complex hormonal control, but it is largely driven by the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus re releases uh, hormones which stimulate the pituitary and which really which then release hormones which stimulate the gonads. Um, in both males and females, that hormonal control exists. But in females, the hormonal control is structured so that it undergoes a cyclic pattern. In males, that is not true. In males, the hormonal levels remain pretty much the same all the time, and sperm production continues the whole time. In females, there is a cycling of uh, hormonal patterns, which leads to, in human beings, every 28 days ovulation and preparation of the uterus to, for receiving a fertilized egg. The hormone that we need to first hear about is the hormone which is released from the hypothalamus. And that is this hormone called gonadotrophin releasing hormone. Remember that the hypothalamus releases releasing hormones, which then act on the pituitary. So they go that short distance to the anterior pituitary, and they uh, stimulate the production of these two hormones called <clears throat> follicular stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone. And you'll see why these get those names <clears throat> when we talk about their influence on the ovary. Um, they, the same hormones do operate in, women, in men as, it, uh, as well, but they have a different effect. Um, so the other thing to, to, to say about um, all of these hormones is we're going to talk about their impact on uh, reproduction specifically and specifically on the, uh, how they end up producing the gametes. Um, but they have global effects on the body. They have, there are many, many uh, different organ systems which will respond to the presence of these hormones especially after puberty, at, at, at and after puberty. So the, in human beings, this 28-day cycle, if human beings and some other primates, the, the apes especially, um, there is a monthly cycle in which the uterus is prepared to receive a fertilized ovum. To receive a zygote. It actually receives the zygote in the form of a blastocyst at some distance along its development after fertilization. The uterus develops a, th a thick lining called the endometrium. And it's, it's quite an elaborate structure. And once a fertilized egg uh, embeds in it, then the fertilized egg forms a placenta, which it forms a, a union with the endometrium for the duration of the pregnancy. However, if there's no implantation, if there's no fertilization and no implantation of an embryo, that endometrium is shed. And it is shed once, once in a 28-day cycle 
for a day or two as the and as a bleeding period of menstruation and that we have a way of dating everything that we're going to talk about and that is from day one day one is the first day of bleeding it's the first day of shedding of the endometrium so that's an important point um, when we look at this process, at the cycling, we need to recognize that there are in fact two cycles going on uh, in the female. First of all, there is a uterine cycle that we've already described, the building of the endometrium, and then if it's not to be used, the shedding of the endometrium during menstruation, and then the rebuilding, and then the shedding again. But there, at the same time, there are cycles in the ovaries, and the cycle in the ovary is for the growth of a follicle and the maturation of, a, of an oocyte ready to be expelled so that it can be fertilized. So there's an ovarian cycle and a menstrual cycle. And those have to be coordinated. And the way that they are coordinated is through the hormones. It, this, um, what we're going to see that the central control is through the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus coordinates these cycles so that ovulation takes place at the correct time, so that building of the endometrium takes place at the correct time. Okay, now I know. This looks, this looks hellishly complicated. And I can't uh, emphasize too much <laughs> that it actually is complicated. Because what we've got is what we've got to watch. We're going to watch changes in hormonal status, and we're going to watch changes in physical status as well. And we're going to see how these are, are coordinated. But luckily, um, your textbook manufacturers have given you um, a nice way to follow this because they have labeled everything for you. So when you're studying this and you're going to have to like go over this several times, write it out and everything. Follow these. You see, go one, two, um, three, four, etc. That's what we're going to do. Stop me if I go wrong anywhere, because <clears throat> on my screen I have to tell you these are a little bit small. But I try and tell you the story in the same order that the text tells it. And so we're going to start here, number one. Here's a very important point to be made about this, the functioning of the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. There is a strange feedback and feed forward regulation, which we need, to, uh, we need to understand. First of all, the hypothalamus is going to be inhibited by high levels of these two hormones. Estradiol, we often refer to it as estrogen, and progesterone. So if with their high levels of, of estradiol and progesterone, the hypothalamus is going to be inhibited, not completely. It will continue to function, but it's, it will, its activity will be dampened down. However, the hypothalamus is stimulated by high levels of estrogen on its own. If there's only estrogen and no progesterone, that provides a positive feedback to the, to the hypothalamus. The anterior pituitary is inhibited when there are low levels of estradiol. So I know that that's, it's difficult to put, all of, put those together, but what we're going to find is there's actually, it's a summation. There is a feed forward when there's, estrogen present, the hypothalamus is going to be stimulated until such time as there is a combination of estrogen and progesterone, and you'll see how that happens. And once there's a combination of those two, then the hypothalamus gets shut down again. When there are low levels of estrogen present in the body, then the whole system is dampened down, but not completely. Okay, so let's have a look, see what, see what happens. 
First of all, the hypothalamus is going to be releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone that acts on the anterior pituitary and it produces these two hormones, follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Now I have a look here and you'll see that the levels of luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone initially are very low. Nonetheless, they have an important function. Even at low levels, they cause one of the follicles in the ovary to begin to mature. There, well, I won't talk about the, the these, but there's actually a battle between follicles in the ovary to see who comes out on top. Once one comes out on top, usually only one goes. Sometimes you get a couple go, but usually only one follicle will win the competition and end up proceeding to develop. Remember, it's sitting there with an oocyte in it, which is arrested, at, was arrested in the fetus. So now it's got to go through all of the rest of its meiosis. That follicle that is forming here is in itself a little endocrine gland. And what, is it, what, it, that, what that endocrine gland does is it begins to produce estradiol estrogen. So this little follicle here is producing estrogen. And that estrogen is, to, is beginning to circulate. So what is going to happen? Well, have a look up here and you'll see as this estrogen begins to rise, <clears throat> this inhibition on the anterior pituitary is lifted. And the hypothalamus is going to start being stimulated a little bit. So there's a feed forward. There's a positive feedback. And what happens? Well, the hypothalamus is going to start producing more gonadotropin releasing hormone. The anterior pituitary is going to start producing more and more luteinizing hormone. That stimulates the follicle even more and even more estrogen is produced. If we follow what happens from the, from the pituitary hormones, we'll see that we begin to get a very rapid increase in luteinizing hormone. Um, I'm missing five, where am I? Oh yes, here. This is the, we're following estradiol, right? That's released by the, the follicle. That causes the luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone to, to start peaking. This takes time, but then it goes faster and faster and faster and faster and faster until it reaches a critical level. And at that critical level, it causes this, the follicle to burst and to release the oocyte. Stage two of meiosis, by, by the way, now begins. And that, that ovulation releases that ovum the ovum is picked up by the fallopian tubes and begins to get wafted down the fallopian tubes ready to be fertilized. So where were we? We are at six, we are at our burst of um, luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone. And that has caused the, this follicle to rupture. Now, all of a sudden, this follicle stops functioning briefly and the amounts of luteinizing hormone, follicular stimulating hormone plummet. But this follicle doesn't just wither away and die. The follicle now um, metamorphoses and it turns into this little body here. I'm just trying to make sure I follow the, the numbers. We got seven, right, maturing follicle, eight, it's, uh, it ruptures eight, it forms the corpus luteum. This corp that follicle now forms this little body called the corpus luteum. And this is where luteinize, that name luteinizing hormone comes from because it, the corpus luteum uh, was originally observed to arise after there had been this burst of luteinizing hormone. It is literally, luteus means yellow and it is literally yellow. It's a little small, it's a small, body in the ovary and it is hugely significant because 
it produces two hormones. It produces estrogen and it produces progesterone. Now, wait, we heard about that. We heard about that. We heard here that the hypothalamus is going to be inhibited by estradiol and progesterone together. And that is indeed what happens. We're going to see now that the hypothalamus gets shut down. It stops, it slows the production of gonadotrophin releasing hormone. It slows the production of luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone. But it, the corpus luteum continues to produce estrogen and progesterone. Okay, that tells us the story of how the hypothalamus and the ovary interact. Okay, they, you can see now why there is the cycling, the cycling of the ovarian activity is because there is a cycling of these hormones and the peculiar burst of, of hormones is because of the strange structure of stimulation and inhibition of the hypothalamus. But we need to also ask what is happening in the uterus? Because don't forget, we have a uterine cycle as well. So remember what I said, we're gonna date from the first day that the, uh, of the bleeding of the menstrual cycle. So um, this, is, this diagram simply shows the structure of the uterine wall over time. So at menstruation, the, the, the beginning of menstruation, the endometrium in the uterus is thick, but it rapidly breaks down um, and is shed. It's shed during the bleeding period. And here's the first day of the bleed here, proceeding here, okay? And one of the reasons for that is that when the estrogen levels drop very, very low, this endometrium cannot be maintained. So if estrogen is very, very low and there's no other hormonal influence, this, the wall of the endometrium is shed from the uterus. However, as the estrogen <coughs> levels begin to rise, and remember they are rising because of this maturation of the follicle. As the estrogen levels begin to rise, the endometrium begins to build up again. This period here is called the proliferative phase. And it's the period of building and it will continue all the way through until ovulation. And by ov ovulation, usually the endometrium is pretty much mature. And the, the, this, the endometrium after that, remember we've, we've got a drop in estrogen levels, but, the, estro but it's not the endometrium is not shed here because the corpus luteum produces progesterone and estrogen. And progesterone and estrogen are going to maintain the endometrium. So this diagram here shows what, <clears throat> what happens if no fertilization takes place. If no fertilization takes place, the corpus luteum gradually begins to wither away. And now there is no, there's very low levels of estrogen. It's, it begins to get very low levels of progesterone. And there's nothing now to maintain the endometrium. And at the end of this 28 day cycle, the, the endometrium is shed during menstruation again. And we begin the whole cycle all over again. So we have to ask now, well, what about if implantation actually does occur? You can't, if we've got a, a fertilized egg, we can't be shedding this uh, um, endometrium because the, the fertilized egg has to implant in the endometrium, form the placenta and proceed with development. The answer is that the corpus luteum here is make, can be maintained as long as there are hormones coming from the placenta, 
the placenta, once fertilization takes place and implantation takes place, the placenta itself acts as an endocrine gland, releasing hormones which maintain the corpus luteum. And as long as the corpus luteum is maintained, then progesterone estrogen levels remain high. And as a result, we maintain the endometrium for the period of the, um, uh, of the pregnancy. I know it's hellishly complicated. And what is so complicated about it is that we have these different cycles that have got to be meshed together. So let's just go over what is happening here. First of all, we won't worry about the, the hormones, okay? What is happening in the ovary? Well, once every 28 days, <clears throat> one of the follicles present in the ovary begins to mature. And it ma matures, when it matures, it actually grows. It swells, it gets really big. The contents are actually under some degree of pressure. Uh, you can think of it like a pressurized balloon. And um, the inside there, the ovum itself is being richly invested with foodstuffs. So it forms a very large cell. It's one of the very one of the largest cells ever produced in the human body is the human ovum. That uh, follicle is going to burst and is going to release the ovum. But the point, a uh, whole point of all of this complexity is that the ovum has to be released at an appropriate time. The ovum has to be released at a time when the uterus is going to be receptive to it. Once the, once the follicle ruptures, it heals back up to form this little body called the corpus luteum, which is itself an endocrine gland and which produces hormones and those, the hormones that the corpus luteum produces are the hormones which are mainly responsible for maintaining this endometrium. If the corpus luteum fails, which it will do if there's no fertilization and no implantation, if the corpus luteum fails, it will stop producing hormones, the progesterone and estrogen. And as a result, the endometrium can't be maintained and it will be shed. So what we have is the ovarian cycle, and then we have a uterine cycle, building the endometrium, shedding the endometrium, building endometrium, shedding the endometrium. We have to coordinate those two. This egg needs to be released at a time when the endometrium is appropriately thick and mature. And that is, that is done by the hormones which are released by the anterior pituitary, but the, they are released from the anterior pituitary in response to the hypothalamus assessing the status, the re reproductive status of the ovaries and the uterus. So if, can you, I need to know whether you know enough to be able to follow the story through one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I want to know whether you know enough now to do that, or if you want me to go through it again. I'm not going to go through it again if it's simply going to confuse you even more, because the most important thing about this is that you need to uh, clarify this for yourselves. And so what I advise you to do is to write down 10 points, one, one to 10. And for each of those points, write out exactly what is happening at the, that time. Remember, we're going to start off hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is going to release gonadotrophin releasing hormone the first low levels of luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone. But this functions as a feed forward mechanism. And as a result, luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone begin to build up. They build up to a critical, very high level, which causes 
the, uh, the follicle to rupture. Maturation of the follicle is under control of these hormones, right? When they peak and ovulation occurs, then there's a, a, suddenly all of this inhibition take, starts to take place and the levels of luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone plummet, but they are replaced. Those, they're replaced in their impact by these other hormones here, estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen and progesterone together operate differently than they do singly on the hypothalamus. They inhibit the hypothalamus. But as long as we've got high levels of estrogen and progesterone, we maintain the uterine lining. If no implantation takes place, the corpus luteum dies, progesterone, estrogen levels plummet, and now we're back to where we were at the beginning, low levels of, generally low levels of hormone, and the uterine wall is shed in menstruation. Okay, easy peasy. No, it's not. I'm not going to tell you that it, that it is, but it is easy because there's so many facts here that need to be meshed together. But once you do that, once you mesh them together, you're going to be able to see that this is a clear uh, story. Okay, so uh, let's think about a little bit about what happens um, at uh, fertilization. First of all, remember the, the, uh, the, the ovum as it's released is at the very last stage of its meiotic divisions. And it will stay there unless it is fertilized. Immediately it's fertilized, it completes its meiosis, spits out its last polar body and the union of genetic material, the sperm and the egg occurs and we end up with a diploid egg. That diploid egg, that fertilization usually takes place high up in the fallopian tubes. So the sperm have to actually have to make their way all the way to the up into the upper reaches of the fallopian tube for fertilization to take place. It can take place lower down, um, but it usually takes place uh, up here. The walls of the fallopian tube um, are ciliated. So this is ciliated epithelium and they waft the, the, the egg down uh, towards the uterus. Of course, development begins immediately and actually it uh, undergoes a substantial number of divisions um, before the egg enters the uterus. And it usually implants as a blastocyst. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, development, but um, this is a stage of development where the cells have divided enough to form a hollow ball. And that hollow ball is called the blastocyst. And it is the blastocyst that embeds into the endometrium. As soon as the, it embeds like that, it, the egg begins to develop into the, into the embryo. But a major part of the embryo of its structure is the, the placenta. Um, all of the membranes and everything that result from these complex divisions of the fertilized egg end up forming an um, a placenta. And the placenta, we said interdigitates. It forms finger-like projections which uh, link up with the endometrium very tightly. So the exchange of oxygen, nutrients, etc., can take place across the cell membranes between the mother and the fetus. But that placenta is in itself um, a, a gland. It's an endocrine gland. And it releases a substance called human chorionic gonadotrophin, HCG. And human chorionic gonadotrophin is responsible, oh, sorry, for maintaining the corpus luteum. So the corpus luteum carries on as a functional body as long as there are high levels of a chorionic gonadotropin, HCG. So the 
obviously menstruation stops. And for the duration of the pregnancy, the, the endometrium is maintained in conjunction with, with the placenta. Um, that in human beings, this is, you know, is a nine month procedure. Um, and as long as pregnancy persists, um, there is a strange feature um, of the uterus itself. And this is that the, the uterus for most of the pregnancy remains completely insensitive to the presence of a hormone called oxytocin. Now oxytocin, we've heard about before. And um, <clears throat> you'll remember that uh, oxytocin is secreted by um, the pituitary. Um, and it is secreted from the pituitary under various circumstances and has many, diff we've heard different functions of it. We heard, for example, um, that it operates on the uh, smooth muscle of the breast to pump milk. Um, here, we're gonna watch as it operates on the smooth muscles of the uterus to cause the uterine contractions of labor. So obviously, oxytocin has something to do very often with smooth muscle. Um, and it causes contraction. But the, for most of the pregnancy, the uterus remains insensitive to the presence of oxytocin, just doesn't respond. The cells actually don't have any receptors for oxytocin. They only develop the receptors for oxytocin as pregnancy reaches its end. And now the uterus begins to be sensitive to the presence of oxytocin. Remember that this estradiol, estrogen, is being secreted from the ovaries, uh, uh, from, from, and from, uh, the, from the corpus luteum, for example, is being secreted. So that is in, in circulation. And this uh, the, it actually ends up activating the uterus to start becoming sensitive to oxytocin. At the same time, um, there is a positive, begins a positive feedback mechanism. This le the level of estradiol and oxytocin reaches a critical level and stimulates labor to begin. But as soon as uh, uterine contractions begin, there is a positive feedback and the positive feedback is to the pituitary and to the hypothalamus as well, in actual fact, to get the pituitary to produce masses of oxytocin. Oxytocin stimulates the uterus to contract. Uterine contractions stimulate the production of more oxytocin. It's a classic feed forward or positive feedback. And the contractions now begin to come with regularity and with increasing strength until such time as the fetus is actually expelled. Um, once the fetus is expelled, and especially once the uterus, um, once the placenta has been expelled, then the sensitivity to oxytocin is lifted and the uh, uterine contractions will stop. Now, interestingly enough, the oxytocin has switches, roles, and it now has a completely different function and a very interesting function. It has a very, very powerful psychological impact. And oxytocin, in high levels of oxytocin in circulation immediately after birth are one of the reasons that there is this instant very, very powerful bonding, maternal bonding between the child and the mother is not only good feeling and everything else, it is actually the result of circulating oxytocin. I told you before, oxytocin is called the loving hormone. That's one of the reasons. It's one of the hormones which stimulates that feeling of bonding. Okay, so here's something strange. Uh, there are a number of things about human reproduction which are a little bit strange, um, which make us look a little bit different. Uh, to most animals. One of them is this regular cycle 
the 28 day cycle. We only share that characteristic with, uh, with the apes. In most other, um, and even in the apes, by the way, um, it's not necessarily uh, once a month. Um, but uh, most animals only uh, become fertile, only ovulate um, once a year or something like that, maybe a couple of times a year. Uh, we undergo uh, this regular cycling all the way from puberty up until anywhere from um, late 30s, early 40s, up until 50s, when the cycle begins to shut down in the female. And this is a period called menopause. And um, it's uh, the exact reasons why menopause occur um, are quite complicated. They have to do not only with loss of sensitivity to hormones, by ovaries, for example, they become less responsive to luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulator hormone, but also changes in the hypothalamus as well. But menopause is very interesting. It's very unusual. Most animals remain fertile for most of their lives, and then maybe only at the very end when they become senescent, when they begin to actually die, do they lose their fertility. Here in human beings, women lose their fertility when they are actually really relatively young and when they're usually at extremely healthy. Um, this, is, uh, this can't really be considered as part of the aging process because women enter menopause when they really are quite young and has been, as it has been demonstrated over and over again. If you uh, stimulate women in menopause with hormone, the correct hormones, they can become fertile again, and they can in fact have children perfectly successfully. So it's an interesting question, why menopause? Why stop? So, you know, when people are really quite young, very, very healthy, but they lose their fertility. It has been proposed that this in fact has a huge evolutionary advantage. And um, this is the re what they call the grandparent hypothesis. The grandmothers especially have a huge amount to contribute to the society, but they can't do or make their major contributions if they are themselves engaged in raising children in producing children and raising babies. Instead, there's an advantage. We have, the, we have life segregated so that you have a fertile period when you're really young, um, raise your children to a certain age when they become more or less independent. And then the woman loses her fertility and she now becomes a contributor in providing care for, for her own children, but for their children as well. She begins to contribute more widely in, in the society. That's the theory anyway. But menopause is a very, is a somewhat strange phenomenon in the animal kingdom. I'll only very briefly talk about um, uh, hormonal uh, impact on male fertility. Um, it's, uh, as we know, male, males produce sperm the whole time. There is no cycling. Um, but interestingly enough, it's the same hormones, follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which are responsible for shepherding the production of sperm, but also the production of testosterone by, by the testes. Um, uh, follicular stimulating hormone operates directly on a group of cells called the Sertoli cells. And the Sertoli cells are kind of support cells which nourish developing sperm. They also, in a way, guide the development of the, of the sperm. So Sertoli cells operate under the influence of follicular stimulating hormone. Luteinizing hormone regulates a group of cells called the Leydig cells, which produce the male hormones, testosterone being the most important one, but there are a couple of, of others as well. 
And those hormones are what drive the, the, the production of sperm. So totally cells guide the development once they have been produced, but the, um, the Leydig cells ultimately end up uh, driving the actual divisions that will produce the sperm. And there is, again, a chatter between the gonads and the hypothalamus. And the levels of, it's the levels of testosterone primarily, which regulate the production of follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone from the pituitary. And that is done under the control of the hypothalamus. Um, there are, there's one other slight complication. And that is that the Sertoli cells produce a, a, a hormone called inhibin. It has various functions, but that is its major function actually is an, as an inhibiting hormone. And inhibin exerts a negative feedback on the anterior pituitary. Testosterone exerts a negative feedback on the pituitary and on the hypothalamus. So there is an optimum level of testosterone, which is required for, to produce sperm, and then also to maintain the Sertoli cells, which nourish the sperm. Sertoli cells and Leydig cells thus are both operating through the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary to maintain homeostasis, a homeostatic level of testosterone. In. And I think that that is it. I know um, that you're going to have to sit down and uh, spend some time actually going through this, go through that dia those diagrams really carefully. Um, but I, of course, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have at the moment. Anybody? No, okay. I don't have any questions. Okay, all right then. Um, and then I'll see you. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. All right. And I'll put okay. up a new. I'll be putting up a new assignment this this week as well. All right. Okay. Oh, I, I, the one thing I did Wait, want I to say. I just had one question, Professor. Yes go, yes, go ahead. So the um, we're also supposed to be doing the homework on my lab and mastering, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank yes. you. But I see you on no, Wednesday. Yes, they're, they're, I, those are open till the end of the semester. Okay, so there's no due dates on them until the end of the semester. Okay, thank you. Right, okay then.